Perfect. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Kiki Mutis and I am the volunteer. I was going to say my old title. I am so sorry. I am the operations manager and volunteer coordinator at Pelican Harbor Seabird Station. Pelican Harbor Seabird Station is an incredible nonprofit organization. We've been around for 41 years, helping to treat and rehabilitate sick, yeah. injured, and orphaned na native wildlife. We started primarily only with pelicans, uh, with Darley, uh, Darlene and Harry Kelton, a co retired couple who lived off a houseboat right in the marina. One day they saw an injured pelican. They scooped it up. They saw it had fishing hooks, removed the fishing hooks, took care of it in their little bathtub, in their houseboat, released it. And neighbors being neighbors kind of saw that, hey, these people, they know what they're doing. And they got more and more pelicans and more pelicans and more pelicans. Eventually, they befriended a veterinarian and Pelican Harbor was started. And about nine years ago, this incredible woman, Yaritza Acosta, joined the team. She is our current uh, manager of the clinic at the Seabird Station. She oversees a very dedicated and skilled staff of rehabbers that get these animals that come in. And I often say that we are the Ryder Trauma Center or the Jackson Memorial Hospital of the wildlife animals. We get patients that come in because they were shot, because they were poisoned, they were hit by cars, they were burned by methane and their, and their feathers were singed. They were a cat by, attacked by a cat or a dog. And oftentimes we don't know the reason of injury but the rehab team is able to rehabilitate them and oftentimes, you know, release them back into the environment. Today, we are going to be talking about avian ba basics, birding 101. So on that note, I'm going to share, uh, allow Yaritza to share the screen and Yaritza, you are on. Okay. Um, so my name is Yaritza and like Kiki said, I've been at Pelican Harbor for about nine years. Um, and I actually been a wildlife rehabilitator for going on 12 years now. So I learned it back in college um, in North Carolina, um, where I went to school. There was a rehab center on site and you can actually take it as a class, which I did. And I didn't know anything about wildlife rehab. Found out it was a thing, fell in love with it and has stuck with it ever since. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, just avian basics. So maybe some information a lot of people might know, um, but this presentation, uh, I usually get to newer interns when they're starting out with us, just so they have a better handle on what the animals they are working with and treating, and a better understanding about how or why we treat them or handle them or do what we do for them. Can everyone see this okay? I guess, yeah. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to talk um, a little bit about the common uh, family orders that we see um, come through our doors, some species identification tips, and then some natural history on uh, several of the more common species that we treat at Pelican Harbor. Um, so this is kind of a very small image showing the breakdown of the family orders for birds. There are a lot of different uh, species of birds out there, a lot of kinds of birds. There's 23 orders um, in total, and then they're all broken down um, by their like sub orders and things like that. So this image is kind of cool. It kind of gives you an idea of like their tree um, kind of broken down. Um, so we're gonna talk about songbirds, birds of play, prey and water birds today um, as the more common orders that we see at Pelican Harbor. So songbirds or passerines um, are the largest order and there's about 5,000 plus species in this order. Um, and they range from really small birds like warblers, sparrows, things like that, to bigger birds like ravens um, and like crows and things like that. So a big uh, varying um, variety within this order. Um, the majority of them are insect eaters, 
but some of them are omnivorous, like the corvids, like blue jays and crows, um, who will eat more than just insects, who are opportunists and will even scavenge for food and things like that. So these two images here, um, this kind of blue uh, bird is a um, black-throated blue warbler. Um, and then this other red bird is a scarlet tanager. So usually when I'm doing this with the interns, I'll kind of uh, quiz them along the way and try to see if they know what the species of birds are um, as they go on. And then um, within the passerines, you have the columbiformis. So these are your pigeons and doves. And there's about 300 species of birds um, in this order. And they're primarily seed eaters. Uh, maybe they'll eat some insects, but for the most part, they're strictly seed eating um, birds. And these birds have true crops. So they have um, like a little pouch um, or area in their throat where when they eat seed, this is where it's stored first and kind of as a broken down um, kind of um, before it gets to the stomach area where it's finally uh, digested. Um, so these guys have, have true crops and sometimes these guys have injuries to their crops and we have to carefully uh, suture them up or treat them in some way so they're able to use that crop like normal. Um, and so this image here is a morning dove. Um, the kind of dead giveaway when you see these guys in the wild, there's these black spots on the wings and they even start to get these as fledglings. So you'll kind of know that that's a morning dove. Um, and then this bird over here is a white winged dove, um, which is a non-native species to Florida, but another dead giveaway, you see this white patch along the wing here. And then the pisiformis, um, these are your woodpeckers. Um, and these actually also include uh, toucans and those kinds of birds. And this is about 400 species um, and they are arboreal. So these guys are hunting in trees, they're living in trees. Um, they prefer to be clinging to the side of a tree um, and finding food in like the crevices and the holes of the bark and things like that. Um, and so these guys are usually always strictly insectivores or insect eating birds but they will eat like fruits and sap from the trees and things like that. Um, so this is a red bellied woodpecker. Um, and so you may get confused because you see red on the head, um, but you can't really tell it, but they also have red on the belly when they're adults. And there actually is a red headed woodpecker, um, but it, uh, the red is covered the whole head. So there's a red headed and this is a red belly woodpecker. Um, and then you get into um, your Accipitriformis, um, which are your hawks, your eagles, your osprey. And these include about 200 species. Uh, these guys are usually soaring birds. They're broad winged, um, strictly meat eaters. Um, so they're eating rodents, um, other small birds, uh, mice, um, things like that. Um, so this image here is a Cooper's hawk, um, which is a bird eater. Um, and they're actually, even though they have broad wings, they're actually pretty fast flyers. So they have to be able to catch songbirds. Um, so uh, that's interesting because normally uh, these guys are broad winged and they're soaring and they're perching somewhere high, watching for little rodents, you know, crossing the street or things like that. And then they just kind of dive bomb them. Um, and then you have your, uh, this image here is a uh, turkey vulture. Um, and so if you're seeing this guy soaring above you, the way that you can tell is a turkey vulture is that the black of the feathers will form a T. So the white will kind of get lighted out and you'll see like a T form in the sky. And so that's how you know it's a turkey vulture. Whereas black vultures, you'll only see kind of light color on the ends of the feathers. So that's a black vulture. And we get both those species at Pelican Harbor, we treat both of them. Um, and then going into the falconiformis. Um, so this is about 60 species. Um, again, meat eaters are carnivorous. Uh, these guys, falcons are usually uh, bird eaters. So they're also fast flyers. 
Um, so they have long, narrow wings. They're not really broad winged like um, other types of um, broad winged hawks or red shoulder hawks. They're more narrow winged because they have to be able to really slice through the sky and fly really fast. Um, so this includes your kestrels, peregrine falcons, and your caracaras, which this image here is a peregrine falcon. And the cool thing about these guys is they have something called a beak tooth. So on their beak, on the sides of their beak, they have these kind of little points um, that come just kind of jut out, kind of like, I guess, little fangs. And that's normal for them. And that helps them tear their prey um, and rip it apart. Um, other types of hawks don't really have this feature. They just have regular sharp curved beaks and they just have stronger bites. So they're able to tear their prey um, with their bite strength. And then the Strigiformis. Um, so these are your owls, um, about 180 species. Um, and these can also range uh, in size from small owls like your pygmy owl or your um, Eastern screech owl to large owls like gray horned owls um, or great gray owls or things like that. Um, also mostly carnivorous uh, eating rodents um, small or other small mammals um, or birds, but some of the smaller owls will eat insects or lizards even like screech owls, um, especially in Florida, will also eat insects and a lot of lizards. Um, and then some of these owls have ear tufts, uh, which like screech owls, gray horned owls have these kind of uh, little patch of feathers on the head, which looks like little tufts. Um, so people always think that those are their ears, but those are just feathers that are um, coming out of their head. Their ears are actually on the side of their head and they're just like holes pretty much. Um, but some owls have just rounded um, like flat um, heads, like the barred owl. They don't have ear tufts, they're pretty rounded. Um, and then owls, they are mostly active at night. So that's when they're usually hunting and that's why they have silent flight. So they can sneak up on their prey in the night. Um, and it's really cool because um, the owls have specialized feathers on the ends of their wings that help wind pass through. Um, so they have that silent flight. Um, so in rehab, when we get owls that have messed up those feathers, we have to wait for them to molt to make sure that they are silent flighted before release. Um, and these images are actually two uh, ambassador screech owls that we used to have. This one is Shere Khan, um, and he came in with an eye injury. You can see that there. And this was Aries, um, and Aries came in with uh, permanent feather damage from a cat attack. Um, so these guys were rehomed and living happily um, elsewhere. And then Pelicaformis. Um, so our favorite, our mojo, the pelicans. Um, and this order includes cormorants and hingas, frigate birds. Um, all these guys usually have a guler pouch of some kind. Pelican's pouch is pretty prominent, um, pretty well known. So you usually see that pretty easily. But frigate birds also have sort of a pouch. Um, cormorants also have a little mini pouch. It's just not as big or prominent, but it is there along with the anhingas. So usually they're able to kind of get down bigger fish than you would think because of that. Um, so this includes about 66 species. Um, these guys are pretty uh, colonial, so usually you'll mostly see them uh, in groups for the most part, but sometimes you'll get your solo uh, pelican or cormorant just kind of hanging out. Um, and the cool thing about these is um, their webbed feet, all four of their toes are webbed. Um, so I guess like this. So like if you see a duck, only those first three toes are webbed and they have this like vestigial little toe that's not, but these guys have an actual toe and it has a webbing there too. So it's called uh, totem palmate webbing. So it's, it's just interesting because uh, most um, water birds are just three toed uh, webbing. Um, and so this is an American white pelican down here. So we have one as an ambassador now, Monroe. Um, if you've been here before, you might have seen her, um, you know, hopefully slowly with the tours opening up, you might see her in with our other ambassador pelicans. And she's actually in breeding plumage right now. So she's looking really pretty. She has this breeding horn on the end of her bill and doing good things. And then this other image is actually a brown pelican 
that we rehabbed um, a few years ago as a baby. It came in orphaned and we released it. Um, and he hung out on the sidewalk for a little bit and would kind of jump at the volunteer sometimes. We called him feisty. <laughs> But he eventually went off and did his own thing and went out there. So that's a brown, a juvenile brown pelican there. And then you have your gruiforms. So these are your uh, coots and cranes um, and those kind of related species, rails, things like that. About 190 species. Um, again, these guys can vary in size from your uh, purple gallinule, which is what this colorful guy is down here, um, to your sandhill crane, which are big birds. And this is what this other guy is here. And we've gotten those in rehab before. Um, and you know they need a whole pen to themselves and everything. And they're um, a lot of work, but they're really cool birds. Um, and the cool thing about this, these species or this order is that it has one of the most uh, ancient fossil records um, out there. So you know, when they're digging for bones and stuff, um, they're finding a lot of these guys going back further than a lot of other uh, species that they found. So that's pretty interesting, I think. And then you have Siconiforms. Um, these are herons, bitterns, egrets, ibis, um, those kind of related species of birds, um, long-legged, long-billed, long-necked <laughs> birds. Um, about 127 species. And um, these guys are also colonial for the most part. Some of them, some species are pretty solitary, like the great egret, which is what um, this white bird is down here. Uh, great blue herons are also pretty solitary once they become adults and will only be colonial during, during the breeding and mating season. Um, and then you have your little blue heron, which is what this other guy here is. So he's all blue. Um, so those guys will sometimes be alone, but you'll see them in groups also sometimes. Um, so these guys will primarily eat fish, but they also eat a lot of amphibians, crustaceans, aquatic insects. Um, I've seen great egrets and great blue herons eat lizards, um, other birds. Um, so they're kind of opportunists also and will kind of go for whatever they can get. And then you have your Chirodriformis. Um, so these are your shorebirds, your gulls, terns, plovers, um, skimmers, things like that. About 350 species, um, varying in size, um, not too drastically. Um, like you have your, I guess, little plovers are pretty small, and then you can have like a, a great uh, black back gull. Um, so those can get pretty big. Um, these birds usually have pretty extensive migration routes. Um, so I think it's a type of turn, um, I want to say least turn, but maybe not that, uh, migrates like a crazy far distance from like north to south and vice versa. Um, usually pretty colonial, you'll see them on the beaches in big groups, um, hanging out, um, usually probably trying to ask for scraps from people. <laughs> um, and they uh, like to hang out. Usually you won't see them too solo hanging out. That, would be kind of odd and usually we'll have at least a pair or something like that. I think they just feel more comfortable in a, a group setting. Um, this guy down here is a laughing gull in breeding plumage. So uh, these guys will get the black head, they'll get reddish on their bill um, and they'll get reddish legs and they just look really pretty. And then this other guy here is a black skimmer. So you can see why they call them black skimmers. So they skim the tops of large bodies of water um, for fish. And their beak is so sensitive to touch that as soon as it senses anything, they snap down really hard um, and will eat whatever they, they caught. Um, so those guys are pretty interesting to have in rehab. We call them like scissor beak birds because they can cut you up pretty bad. <laughs> um, so going on to just some identification tips. Um, if you're ever confused about what to classify, to classify a bird, if you don't know if it's a songbird or a raptor or anything else like that, um, there's some, some tips that I'll go over. Um, so on the, this image here with all the different heads, looking at the different types of beaks can really, or bills can really help you determine uh, what that bird eats or might eat. So it can kind of help you determine how to classify that bird. 
but that can also be tricky because we have a lot of crossover with various things. Um, so like a generalist beak, they labeled it, um, is for like crows or corvids, um, blue jays. So they just have a general um, short, broad bill, maybe with a pointy tip because um, they're either scavenging um, or foraging. It can kind of do a variety of things. Whereas something like this bill, this mud probing, um, you'll see on um, like uh, shorebirds that are probing into the mud. So you know they're looking for insects or aquatic things. Um, if it's long and curving, either curving down or curving up or straight, they might be like a probing type of bird. Um, so you know they're eating insects maybe most likely. Um, pelicans are pretty um, commonly known. You'll know what a pelican bill looks like. Uh, something like chiseling where it's like longer than normal um, but broad, really pointy at the end. So these are woodpeckers. Um, so these guys are pecking at wood. So they have to be strong builds um, and pointy and things like that. And then raptors are usually for the most part a dead giveaway too, because they'll have like a curve or a point to it. Um, so you know that they're just used for ripping uh, things apart. And then another thing is looking at the feet. Um, so what kind of feet do they have can help determine um, what kind of substrate you need when they're in rehab um, or what kind of caging they might need or perching or maybe no perching. Um, so sometimes um, birds are flat footed like doves and pigeons. Um, so they are perfectly fine being on the ground. You may provide some sort of broad um, perching for them, but it doesn't have to be anything like skinny where they really need to grab on because they're flat footed and they are comfortable with that. Um, pelicans or ducks or seabirds are flat footed too. Um, but if they have webbing, then you know that it is some sort of water bird and you need to provide a water source for it eventually to swim um, and things like that. Um, and then you have, if a bird has really long talons or sharp claws, then you might most likely know that it's a type of raptor or bird of prey. Um, songbirds can vary, like I said, um, but usually they'll have um, kind of curved like feet. They won't be flat footed for the most part. So they usually um, need to have um, a variety of sizes of perching to make sure that they're gripping um, naturally so they don't develop any sores on their feet or things like that, which is what you don't want to happen while a bird's in rehab, you don't want any secondary injuries or anything like that while you're treating them. Um, so this is like um, a little test that I would give the interns to see if they kind of can guess what these species are, but I'll just kind of name them for you. So this bill here or this beak is for a sparrow um, or maybe a finch. Um, so this is a seed eating beak. So it's pretty broad, it's short. Um, it, it looks like he has a point, but they're usually not pointy. Um, so this is gonna be used for cracking seeds open. Um, so they're usually gonna have stronger bites also because um, they need to be able to bite through you know, a variety of different seeds. Um, and then this long pink bill uh, is for a white ibis. So these guys are usually probing and foraging um, in the mud or in the grasses. After it rains is usually when you really see them in the different puddles in the grass looking for worms and things like that. Um, so long is like a probing beak. And then this next one next to it is a raptor. So this is a bird of prey. So you can see it's curved and it's sharp and to a point. Um, so that's gonna be for ripping um, its prey and, and getting pieces of food that way. And then the one next to it is a crow. Um, so this is just kind of a, it's long, not too long. It's broad, not too broad. It doesn't really have a point to it. So this can do a variety of things. It can forage in the grass. Um, it can kind of rip at prey and eat meat. Um, sometimes they can crack seeds open. It just depends. Um, they'll eat peanuts and things like that. Um, and then finally, the one at the bottom here is a long beak but it is kind of broad. It's not skinny like the white ibis and it does have a point to it. So this is a great blue heron beak. So this beak um, is good for spearing its prey. They like to spear their fish. 
um, or other things and eat them that way. Um, so these guys, we usually are really careful in rehab because um, they like to go for your eyes. And so we wear eye protective gear for them because you just want to be careful. And then again, a little test of the feet to kind of give you an idea of the different types of feet for the species. Um, so starting in, on this side with the yellow feet, so you can tell that these are talons. So they're pointy, they're curved, they're kind of long. Um, so this bird is gripping on a perch. This is a raptor. And then the one next to it is um, long toes, but pretty flat-footed. Um, uh, has nails, but they're not too long. They're not pointy or curved. So you know that this bird is not really perching or anything like that. They're gonna be on the ground. Um, they probably could perch if it needed to, you know, in a tree, um, but for the most part, they're okay being on the ground. I think this is a great blue heron. And then the one next to it. Um, so this is called zygodactyl feet. So these have two toes on the top and two toes on the bottom. Um, so this is a woodpecker. So these guys have long curved nails. They have pretty good grip because they have to be able to grip to the side of trees. Um, and that's this is kind of a dead giveaway, I want to say, for most species of woodpecker, is this two on the front and two in the back. Um, that's the kind of feet that they usually will always have. And then down here, you have your four webbed toes. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So you know that's a pelicaformis, a type of pelican bird. So this is a pelican actually. Um, but again, they're also flat-footed. They will perch in trees. Um, you do wanna provide perching for them, but they don't have to be long skinny branches or um, like for raptors or songbirds, they can be broad, um, big trees or things like that. Um, and then again, down here, we have flat-footed. Um, so we have some long toes. We have a little vestigial back toe. Um, so you can see there, it's there, but not really having a function. Um, so this is a flat-footed bird. I believe this is a crane. And then again, with the flat feet. Um, so this is a dove or pigeon. Um, so longish toes, not really long nails. But these guys are okay being um, on the ground or broad type of wide perching. Um, and then another identification uh, tip is for looking at the feathers. Um, again, this can be kind of tricky because there's a lot of crossover um, or, you know, is it a baby bird? Those feathers look different than an adult bird or a juvenile bird. Um, and a lot of juvenile species can look similar, like a lot of like juvenile gulls can look very much the same as juveniles. And then when they're adults is when they really look different. Um, but thinking about that, the types of feathers, tail feathers, flight feathers, um, downy usually you'll see on babies or really young birds um, or things like that. Um, so these two birds are commonly confused um, with interns um, or other people. Um, when they come into rehab um, and they look similar. Um, and, you know, if you didn't really look at hawks at all, you would think that they're the same bird, but they are two different birds. Um, so this guy is a broadwing hawk and this is a red shoulder hawk. Um, so broadwing hawks are smaller and stockier um, than red shoulder hawks. So you can't really tell from this image, they look the same, um, but they usually have shorter legs whereas red shoulder hawks have longer legs. Um, red shoulder hawks as adults will have the reddish color on the, um, I guess, shoulder um, or inside uh, patagium of the wing. And you can't really see the back of them, but these guys will have um, like black and white striped tails uh, where these guys have more like a brownish black striped tail. Um, you can see that this guy does look more reddish in color whereas this guy is more brown with a uh, white chest. Um, and then uh, these guys, red shoulder hawks, usually have darker brown eyes as adults. Um, broad wings have lighter brown eyes. Sometimes that's hard to tell also. Um, but usually, like I said, I'll test the interns while I'm doing this and see if they can tell me the difference between the two, because it's pretty hard sometimes, especially when you see them flying or far away. 
then it's like, what kind of bird is that? I don't know. Uh, these two species also commonly get confused, um, though they are different. Um, so these two guys on this side are European starlings, which is a non-native species of bird in Florida. And this guy on the other side is a northern mockingbird, which um, is a common native species. So mockingbirds are a lot smaller than starlings as nestlings. Mockingbirds have little, I guess, gray or dark um, gray uh, downy or fluff on them as nestlings, whereas starlings have really a light white to light gray fluff on them. Starlings also have these really big lips um, as nestlings um, and hatchlings, whereas mockingbirds, not so much. Um, you can see just really kind of small lips there. Um, and then these guys are usually really yellow on the outside of their lips, mockingbirds more so white, though they're yellow on the inside of the mouth. That's, that's uh, pretty common there. Um, but they do get confused a lot and they do look similar. Um, but once you see them side by side, it kind of helps you see that they are um, different. Um, and again, these are three species of um, doves that uh, get commonly confused. Um, so starting on this side, this is a morning dove. And like I said earlier in the beginning, the dead giveaway is these black spots on the wings. So this is a fledgling um, and he you know, already has the black spots there. So that's kind of a, a dead giveaway for them. Um, across him, this is a Eurasian collared dove, which is a non-native species of dove. Um, so they don't have black spots as fledglings. This is also a fledgling. And they're also much more gray um, or light brown in color. Uh, motos are more of a darker brown to them. And then below, this third guy is actually a fledgling pigeon. Um, so these guys, because of um, a lot of breeding from people, they can come in a variety of colors. Um, so they can be like stark white, or they have their typical kind of gray color to them, or they can be brown or things like that. Um, so once they're side by side, you can see the difference in them pretty clearly. Um, but sometimes it can be hard if you're seeing them flying or far away to differentiate, you know, what species that is. Um, and so to kind of close, I uh, want to talk about just some of the common, more common species that we get in, just a little background, natural history. Um, some of these, um, you might have heard some of this info on if you attended the last um, talk, um, but, you know, it's good to hear info again. Um, so brown pelicans, like Kiki said, is what Pelican Harbor Seabird Station started rehabbing in the beginning. This is what we focused on, this is what we learned on, this is what we're known for, um, is pelican rehab. These guys are plunge divers. Um, well, actually only two species of pe pelican plunge dive, the brown pelican and the Peruvian pelican, which actually looks like brown pelicans. Um, so they actually will fly high, they'll see a school of fish um, near the surface and they'll plunge dive for them. And you've, you've probably seen them at the beach um, hunting. Whereas other species of pelican actually will just swim in groups or herds and will scare fish into one area and then they're all just kind of dabbling or snapping at the water to eat them. Um, these guys were endangered. They were on the endangered species list um, back in the 70s up until 2009, which is not that far back when you really think about it. Um, but they were endangered because of a pesticide called DDT, which was being used on crops and it not only affected them, but it affected a lot of different species of birds. Um, and what it was doing is it was getting into the environment and these birds were ingesting it or somehow absorbing it. And when they went to lay their eggs, it was making their eggs soft. So when they went to incubate them, their eggs would break too easily, which a pelican should be able to sit on its eggs easy, no breakage or anything like that. Um, so their numbers went down drastically. Um, and then with, through a lot of efforts with um, various organizations and the government, um, the numbers came back and they were taken off the list in 2009. So they're doing good. Um, they can live about 20 years in the wild. They have about a six foot wingspan um, and they can average two to five kilograms, which is about six, five, six pounds. Um, 
It depends, some are bigger than others. And you have East Coast brown pelicans and West Coast brown pelicans. Um, so East Coast brown pelicans look the same, but they actually have a lot more like vibrant orange on their beak or kind of bluish greenish color to their pouch. Um, they're really, really pretty. And sometimes we'll get in a kind of colorful pelican here. And we always wonder like if they somehow made it from the West Coast or something or <laughs> something like that. But that is brown pelicans and then white pelicans um, were also endangered up until 1987. But like I said, uh, these guys hunt in groups. So they will swim in herds, scare fish into an area and then just kind of snap at the water. And these guys are actually bigger than brown pelicans um, and can have an eight foot wingspan. And they live about 20 years in the wild also. It can weigh four, nine, four to nine kilograms, um, which is getting into like 10 pounds or so. Um, a lot of people think that Pelicans in general um, just like weigh so much, but they're actually mostly air sacs. And so they don't weigh that much at all. Uh, American white pelicans are more freshwater birds or wetlands. So you see them mostly in Florida, they'll be in the Everglades for the most part. You don't, won't really see them on the coast, on the beaches. If you do, that's kind of odd. So, you know, give us a call if you ever see a white pelican on the beach, uh, but they prefer like freshwater, brackish water, wetlands, things like that. And then double crested cormorants. Um, like I said, these guys have a little guler pouch also, though it's not as prominent as a pelican. They're deep divers. Um, so they dive really deep for fish. They'll chase fish underwater um, and catch them. And they call them double crested cormorants because during the breeding season, they get these uh, little feather tufts on their head. Like they have two crests, I guess. So they call them double crested and they're eyes get this vibrant blue around them. The inside of their mouth is this like really pretty blue purple color. Um, and they're just really colorful in the face area. Um, they have about a four foot wingspan. Um, again, they can live about 20 years. And these guys actually produce less preening oil than your average, I guess, pelican or other water bird. Um, and that's because they have to be able to get under the water to dive. So they don't need their waterproofing to be as uh, perfect as some other water birds. So sometimes you'll see these guys swimming and maybe just their head and their neck is above water, kind of like anhingas, um, or it looks like they're kind of really sunken into the water and maybe you're concerned that um, they're uh, too in the water, but that's just kind of normal for them. Whereas a pelican should stay on top of the water. Pelicans have really good buoyancy and should be on top of the water. And then your laughing gull. Um, so these guys, uh, we see a lot of come through our doors. Um, they're colonial, like I said before, they're pretty widespread. They adapt to a lot of different areas. Um, so you'll see them on the beaches, but you might see them also hanging around lakes and things like that. Um, and they call them the laughing gull because of this laughing noise they make when they're um, like screaming at each other or upset or things like that. Um, and these guys actually were a uh, victim in the early 19th century to plume hunters, um, like a lot of other like herons and egrets. So they're being hunt hunted specifically for their feathers. Um, I don't think they ever got to the point where they were endangered, luckily, um, but now they're not hunted for their feathers. Um, but this image actually was a photographer that came and took this image of this uh, breeding laughing gull that we came. So it's just like a really cool, like crisp picture. <laughs> mockingbirds, northern mockingbirds are one of the most common songbirds that we get in here during baby bird season. Again, also pretty widespread. Um, you'll see them, you know, east coast, west coast, in the middle of the state. Um, these guys are mimic birds, so they're able to learn the songs um, from different animals. Um, they can learn up to 200 songs. Um, which is pretty interesting. And because of that, back in the 1800s, they are part of the pet trade. So people were actually, I guess, catching these guys from the wild, um, breeding them or selling them as pets because they make such beautiful songs. Um, we've since stopped that, luckily, um, but they are able to mimic a lot of different songs. Um, we actually got in a um, young mockingbird not too long ago that came in sounding like a starling and we're like, oh, they, the mom must have nested like right near starling nest or something because he picked up that sound. 
Um, and he makes his mockingbird sounds too, but then he'll make like the starling sounds, which is interesting. And then the other most common songbird we get is the blue jay. So these guys are a part of the corvid family. Uh, they are also mimic birds, so they can learn um, different sounds and things like that. They're more omnivorous, so they'll hunt for insects, lizards, they'll find rodents, um, they'll eat from your bird feeder, they'll eat a variety of things. Also pretty widespread, you'll see them kind of all over different habitats. Um, these guys actually form pretty strong family bonds. Um, it's kind of a, a corvid thing because crows do it also. Um, so once they fledge from the nest, they actually will hang out in the same area, stay in the same family for up to a year or more before eventually going off and doing their own thing. Um, and they all um, work together to find food and things like that. Um, and they'll form uh, monogamous uh, partners um, for, I want to say, I think it was life for life, but that might be wrong. Um, but yeah, they form pretty strong bonds. So whenever these guys, you know, come in and injured, you know, we always really, even though for every bird, we try to get them back where they're found. But, you know, it's always like, oh, his family's probably waiting for him. Let's get him back exactly where he was found, just in case. Um, uh, again, uh, these birds uh, were captive because they can learn to talk. So sometimes you might see videos out there of blue jays saying various things somewhat. Um, crows for sure can learn to talk. So that's very really interesting. Um, and then for our most common raptor, we get Eastern screech owls, um, pretty very common and widespread. Um, we have Western screech owls and Eastern screech owls. So over here we have Eastern screech owls. And the males are usually smaller than the females because the females are usually the ones that are staying on the eggs and protecting the nest. Um, they are monogamous and they come in two different colors or phases is what they're called, a red phase and a gray phase. So they'll just have either more gray colored feathers to them or they'll be kind of a brownish reddish color to them. And there's no reason why. Uh, because they hang out in the same area, they're eating the same things. It's just kind of a genetic thing where some are kind of reddish and some are grayish. Uh, these guys eat small mammals mostly, but they will eat lizards and insects. And actually in rehab, when we have babies and whatnot, we will feed rodents and insects um, just to make sure. These birds are cavity nesters, so they will find holes in trees that they like and they'll make a nest in there and that's where they'll have their babies. So they don't actually build regular bird nests like songbirds do. They actually like to just find holes in the trees. Um, the oldest was about 14. Um, and this is just an image of a juvenile um, that we had in rehab that came in as an orphan. Um, so right now we have six orphan screech owls that we are raising. Um, our top priority is always re-nesting and reuniting with the parents, but sometimes for whatever reason that's not possible, so we have to raise them in rehab. So that is it. Are there any questions? Thank you, Yaritza. Uh, maybe you can stop sharing your screen yes. so we can open it up to everyone. Yes, okay. Perfect. Please, everyone, you can unmute yourself now and I know that I definitely learned a lot and <laughs> I increased my vocabulary. I know what Toti Palmate is now, which is very cool, among other very interesting words in there. Does any, any questions you guys have, you can please ask them out loud. What, what kind uh, of responsibilities do you have? The volunteers doing, what do you have the volunteers doing with these? Uh, animals that you bring in. So I yeah, so volunteers um, are usually in charge of the cleaning and feeding of our outside pens where these animals are housed. Um, so, you know, the ones that don't get stressed out too easily, they're able to go in, pick up any old food or anything like that, do a quick cleaning, um, provide water and refeed. Uh, we have volunteers that also help with rescues and release of these birds. So they'll transport for us. Um, and then usually the interns are the ones that are getting a lot of the hands-on in the clinic with these guys and learning more about how to treat them. Um, but sometimes, you know, if they've been here long enough, um, the volunteers will be able to do a lot more and whatnot. 
Yeah. And if you're interested in volunteering, we are going to have a volunteer orientation next week. You can send me an email to kiki, K-I-K-I, -K -I, at pelicanharbor.org. And the orientation will let you know about all the glamorous things that volunteers do and some of the things they do not do. Uh, but it'll, I'll talk about how to get involved with Operation Rescue and Release. So. Yeah. Do you know um, what day is that? What day is the orientation? Uh, I am going to plan it. And in fact, I may even do two because they usually might conflict with two people. So I'll look at my schedule. I'm um, sorry. What's your name? Who's talking? Uh, my name is Robert. Robert, okay. Um, perfect. So Robert, I'm still planning and see, uh, it'll be in the evenings, probably around six o'clock to avoid the rush hour traffic and to allow everyone to come home. So I might do it like on a Tuesday and a Thursday or. Okay, gotcha. Monday would be ideal. I think I'm driving. Monday? Okay, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can do Monday. <laughs> <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question about. Um, let me put the video back on. Yeah, I have a question about what the what the stomachs of these birds can handle, because I've seen I've seen an ibis eating trash, like oh, wow. you know tourist areas, and it doesn't seem doesn't seem right. And then yeah. you see the crows. Crows eat everything. You see crows like yeah. in the Everglades by the picnic tables. So I'm just wondering, like, are are some of these birds' stomachs more like? Uh, amenable to eating things other than their natural diet. Yeah, yeah, sometimes they are. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of them have learned to adapt to be around people and have learned where to find the easy meals. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, for the most part, if it's every now and then, they're usually fine. Uh, you know, maybe there's some stomach issues that they pass, but sometimes if this is something that they're doing long term, it can start to um, affect them and they can get nutritional deficiencies and come in with um, issues with their bones if because a lot of times like these birds like crows or blue jays or grackles are just feeding their babies this garbage and then their yeah. babies start to have developmental issues and people will find them and they're you know not developed properly or nutritionally deficient so you know it's really hard and we usually try to educate people to not feed wildlife whether it's on the beach fishing um, or if you're out picnicking somewhere, you know, it's hard sometimes if they're just going right in the trash can and getting it, you can't control mm -hmm. it. Um, but yeah, we do see issues sometimes with it, with certain species for sure. But uh, peanuts are okay, right? Like the unsalted peanut to so leave it in the shell and like, like let the, like the squirrels or blue jays in your yard. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. Um, uh -huh. If that's I, I, just, I was doing that during COVID, like like sitting in the yard and watching the bird eat, the, grab the peanut and take yeah. it somewhere. Yeah. 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 I mean, and it's also hard to see, you know, to tell, like, is that the only thing they're eating? If it is, then that's not good. But are they also foraging naturally? And this is just something every now and then they're doing, then mm -hmm. that's okay. Because a lot of people have bird feeders um, and mm -hmm. they feed all kinds of different species of animals or songbirds mostly. Um, so but yeah, it's like hard to tell. I would say the best way to feed birds in your backyard is to plant the plants that birds recognize as food. Plant yeah. the wild coffee that will provide the berries that birds like, or the firebush that will feed the hummingbirds, or become an insect farmer to attract mm -hmm. the insects that birds like to eat by put, planting a buttonwood. You mm -hmm. know, in the furrowed bark of the buttonwood, you'll have lots of tiny insects that the birds will come and forage. So if you plant the plants that birds recognize in food, you can have this beautiful array of you know, birds in your backyard without getting them used to. And you're also not getting that animal used to being fed by humans and becoming human friendly. Yeah, right, right. I have a what, question. What about, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll let him, I'll be quiet. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hello there. Uh, what's what's something that I can do as a as an individual who has no experience in in, in the avian world? I, I'm coming from the airport. And I deal with planes, not with birds. So, uh, what what could I do to expand my knowledge on based on the native species here in Florida alone? That's awesome. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, um, Cornell has really good websites for learning about birds. Um, usually, if I have a new species that comes in, I'll go to what's it, the birds of North America.org, um, and it has extensive info on birds or buying birds on or buying books on Florida uh, birds in general um, to start also. getting knowledge of that. Uh, Tropical yeah. Audubon uh, does bird guided tours. Fairchild has bird guided tours. Uh, we have an amazing naturalist, uh, Natalie Mahomar. And we are also going to do sometimes live bird really or live live bird tours, you know, with she goes out with a spotting scope where you can come join us and just getting outdoors, you know, and getting a pair of binoculars or just sitting and learning to identify. But or you can become a volunteer at Seabird Station and you learn to identify. Well, you know, well that's why I that's why I signed up. I actually want to volunteer at the station. So nice. you know, I'm, I'm, I like to actually work outside. So going from planes to birds, isn't that much of a difference. It's from man-made to nature now. Yeah. <laughs> nice. It's called biomimicry. You know, humans look at birds and imagine that they could also fly. So we got inspired to create these flying machines by looking at these dinosaurs that, you know, these birds that evolved from dinosaurs. So it's, it's, cool. it, it is crazy. A Citation 10 plane looks a lot like a hawk, actually. Now that you mentioned the presentation, the red shouldered hawk, it looked a lot like a Citation 10 plane because that plane has a really <laughs> big technically. chest and the, the wingspan too. And it looks like a predatory plane if you look at it. So it's the weirdest thing ever. It's like, wow, <laughs> that bird looks exactly like a plane. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I have a question about brown pelicans and how far they fly in a day. Um, I watch them in the mornings on Miami Beach near uh, Hallover, and they seem to be flying from the south in either as a couple or as a large group and making their way north along the beach. And I wonder where their sleeping grounds are. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know exactly the answer. I know that um, for the most part, Florida brown pelicans um, do not migrate. They stay here year round. We have Northern uh, state pelicans that migrate down here and migrate back. <coughs> they like to find um, islands out in the bay to roost for the night um, or areas where there's a lot of um, mangroves or trees where they can get comfortable. Um, roost. We actually have pelicans that roost um, on our property in the trees here or um, at the rookery right in the bay where we're located. Um, birds will go there to roost for the evening. Um, but I think for the most part they stay pretty close to where like hunting grounds are I would say. Um, so I don't think they go very far but I don't know the exact answer for that. That's a good question. I think AC Sigler has a question. Yeah. Oh yeah. You see, you have a question for us. Your hand is raised. You might be muted. Um, we'll come back to you and see. <clears throat> Questions. Something while, I, while we're waiting on questions, something that I want to consider is that a lot of the injuries that come to the Seabird Station are preventable. You know, we get a lot of injuries due to cat attacks or pet attacks. Uh, keep your cats indoors, you know, and it's also not healthy for them. Window strikes, rodenticide poisoning. People don't often realize that if they're putting rat poison out to kill a rat, eventually a hawk or an eagle or a screech owl is going to eat that mouse and get poisoned. This also comes back that if you're putting cat food outside to feed feral cat populations, you're also feeding the rats. And then you put rat poison out and then, you know, it all trickles up. But protecting their habitat, garbage. Uh, you're right, sorry, I remember once that we had a bird that came in and this goes back to Trina's question that it ate a little piece of a shish kebab stick, you know, mm -hmm. and the wood did not come out on x-rays. But sure. because it was out in a park and it ate a piece of a shish kebab stick, eventually, you know, that one did not make it. So very sad. Questions? Yeah, I was wondering, again, I'm always thinking about what birds eat. 
Um, I saw birds eating a lizard, fighting over a lizard yesterday in my yard, but I wondered about if they eat cockroaches yes. or those grasshoppers, those nasty grasshoppers that yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, songbirds will eat them. Um, like the little screech owls might eat them. Uh, possums will eat them. They for sure eat those kinds of insects too. But Trina, what's crazy about those grasshoppers, the lover grasshopper that's like very colorful with yellow and orange, those have warning coloration. And that's one of the few ones that eats poison wood. And warning coloration basically means I taste horrible and disgusting and nasty. So the bird might eat it once and then bleh, throw yeah. it up because it learned to identify the warning coloration of that grasshopper. So same thing with some caterpillars that are like bright. The Atala butterfly lays her eggs on the kunti and the kunti is toxic. So a bird will eat the Atala butterfly or the Atala caterpillar once and they'll get a nasty hangover or food poisoning and then throw up and that image is so distinctive that we'll never, ever, ever eat it again. So that's why some of the caterpillars are so brightly colored to learn not to eat something. Yeah. And are our local snakes, um, the little, um, um, those orange snakes and racers, do they, do they eat smaller birds? Um, they might. They attack them? Mm -hmm. uh, they might if there's you know, a nestling or a fledgling that's unattended or anything like that. They, mm -hmm. opportunist, I'm sure they would. Yep. A yellow rat snake will, but mainly mm -hmm. see them more as rodent control and as, you know, insect control. Yeah. It's good to have yeah. snakes in your yard. Oh, yeah. In Miami Springs, we have a lot of smaller snakes and birds. Yeah. It's a regular zoo around here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wanted to address a question that was asked uh, on the registration forms, but then also on the chat room is invasive species. You know, what happens if we get a starling or if we get a non-native species? Non-native species are the second biggest cause of extinction of species uh, worldwide. Uh, a lot of the non-natives that we have actually are predatory birds that outcompete our native birds for habitat. They push them out of their nest, they might prey on them. Uh, and it's illegal to release non-native species out into the environment. So if we get, you know, we, when someone calls and they found a non-native species, we try to refer them to veterinarians or to an organization that may try to rehab them, but we cannot rehab them because we cannot legally release them. So if an invasive species comes, it would be like us releasing a python kind of, only cuter, you know, back into the environment. So if one of those animals do come in, you know, we do have to, by law, humanely euthanize them. And this question gets asked all the time, but invasive species are the second biggest cause of extinction of, you know, animals. So, you know, we want to protect the little habitat that we have with our natives. And the, and the muscovies does ducks people probably bring you guys a lot of muscovies right they try yeah. but we you know <laughs> we try to refer and you can see you know muscovies you can see how aggressively muscovies go after people to beg for food you know because they're trained and they'll come to this and muscovies will displace our native wading birds our native egress our native herons you know our native other animals from nesting in there so, and you cannot legally release a Muscovy duck. So if you're a nonprofit organization and if for every dollar that you get, you would have to spend 40 cents to treat an animal that's illegal to release, you know, we'd go broke. Other questions? Monica, you have a question. Not really. I am having a little bit of trouble with the connection. I apologize for that. Sorry about that. Okay. No, no, no. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, you have a question. Your hand is raised. Yes. Uh, do you get a lot of peacocks at the Pelican Harbor Seabird Station? They're very plentiful in Coconut Grove. And I was just curious. I know they have a lot of interactions with humans. We uh, get a lot of calls about peacocks. But once again, they are non-native, so we are not allowed to treat them because we would not be allowed to release them back okay. into the environment. Okay, understandable. I call them sexy chickens. <laughs> yeah. 
yes, yes, yes. Any other thoughts, questions? Well, my friends, on that note, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, we're gonna try to have these once a month. The next one, Hannah, who used to work in the clinic. Uh, let me check my date. Stephanie, do you remember what day it is offhand? Um, the next one will be on June 16th. Uh, and Hannah will do one on patient intake. Basically what happens from the time we get a phone call to how the clinic assesses you know, the health of the patient. And I often say, that, you know, and some of you might have heard this in the beginning, like we are the Jackson Memorial Hospital or the trauma center of wildlife. Uh, if you are in rider trauma, it's not a good thing. You know, about four months ago, I got a phone call that my brother was in a motorcycle accident. He's doing okay. But when, right, when you hear that it's from rider trauma, you know, your heart falls. So if you can imagine that had the animal not come to Pelican Harbor, it would have died. You know, either because of the cat attack, the gunshot, the poison, the window strike, or just naturally. So we get animals and we our team, our clinic team is amazing. And you know, I have all kinds of respect and admiration because they have to decipher, you know, beyond a vet, a vet, the owner tells you what happened. They have to try to decipher what happened to this animal and rehabilitate it you know, and hopefully be able to release it back into the environment. There is a, your, your story about the Blue Jays. We had a, a cardinal and I think a Blue Jay that came in that were stuck to glue traps. Someone put glue traps to catch iguanas. And the finder would call us and call us and saying, when is this bird ready to release? Because it's mate is looking for it. Yeah. You know, they had formed a bond and the mate was waiting and waiting and waiting for this bird to be released. So one of the things that I love about the Seabird Station is that we give community members hope, whether they're calling from Fisher Island to Coconut Grove, Liber Liberty City, Little Havana, people across Miami-Dade County want to help as all you guys are here, you know, and we're able to give these birds and these possums and these squirrels a second chance. So we are beyond grateful to everyone that is here. Yaritza, you are incredible and amazing, and we appreciate everything that you and your team does. And Stephanie and the intake team, we get a lot of phone calls from people who are very frantic and willing for help. And to our volunteers who are here, present and past, we thank you. And future, you know, we thank you. So I wish you all a very, very good night. Thank you, my friends. Wishing you all a beautiful evening. Um, thank, you, thank you for everything that you do and thank you for taking care of our wildlife. You guys are incredible. Thank you thank so you. much, guys, for your work too.